Hi, this is Bernie Riley at CRL. The uh, welcome to the um, CRL Global Resources Collection Forum on Science, Technology, and Engineering, or more specifically on uh, historical collections in the area in the fields of science, technology, and engineering. We'll hear from a number of speakers this afternoon. Um, the um, you do uh, at, at this point your lines, your phone lines are muted uh, at certain points in the. Uh, afternoon's proceedings, we will unmute your lines so that you, you could ask questions and, and comment on the um, on the presentations. At any time during this afternoon, though, you can communicate with us by texting in the uh, the text in the chat box in the on the lower right of your screen. So, our presenters this afternoon will be um, Lisa Brower, president of the Linda Hall Library. Stephen Weldon, who is Assistant Professor of the History of Science at the University of Oklahoma, and Stephen Bosch, who is Materials, Budget, Procurement, and Licensing Librarian at the University of Arizona Library, but who also is CRL Global Resources Senior Collections Advisor in Science, Technology, and Engineering. We'll be talking for um, a bit about the um, over, uh, giving you an overview of the Linda Hall Library collections. Uh, next, uh, we'll talk about recent trends in research in the history of science. Then we'll proceed to talk about access to historical science, technology, and engineering materials in the U.S. and Canada. Steve Bosch will give that presentation. And then finally, the, uh, a discussion of strategic priorities for the Global Resources Science, Technology, and Engineering Partnership. That's the CRL Linda Hall Partnership. The CRL Linda Hall Partnership was formed um, last year. Um, at some years ago, uh, people from CRL and Linda Hall started talking about the uh, common collecting interests and collection development interests of the two organizations. Linda Hall has been collecting since the late 1940s uh, large, important bodies of historical, scientific, technological, and engineering materials as well as current materials, as well as subscribing to a lot of current journals in those areas. CRL, uh, soon after its founding in 1949, began to absorb from member libraries uh, back files of a lot of technology journals, scientific journals, industrial journals, and commercial journals having to do with all sorts of sciences and, and technologies. Between the two of us, between the two institutions, very, very big collections and very, very extensive and deep collections of science, technology, and engineering materials have been assembled. The, um, it seemed to be a good place to start a national level effort to preserve and archive for the long term. To, in other words, to guarantee the long term access to the print collections in these three important domains of research. So the partnership was formed. The principal activities of the partnership currently are the all Sierra libraries um, have document delivery of articles from serials at Linda Hall Collections um, grad at no charge. The CRL is subsidizing that, that service from Linda Hall, and that's through the rapid document delivery service. Uh, we have begun to digitize monographs from the Linda Hall Collections, and we will probably do more of that. That's started slowly. But later on, Steve and others will talk about what, uh, where we want to go with that. Uh, we've also, and Steve again will, will address the, the assessment of the gaps and strengths of the uh, respective CRL and Linda Hall collections. Steve has done a very granular analysis of the overlap, gaps, and strengths of the, um, the two collections. And then the, um, we print archiving Linda Hall is agreed to retain the print holdings that they've um, that of their serials collections um, for the long term so there's the certainty that those materials will be available for libraries for the long term at any rate the um, that's the um, that's an overview of what the arrangement is between the Center for Research Libraries and uh, Linda Hall and uh, now we'll get more to the substance of the um, of the arrangements.
Thanks, Bernie. <clears throat> this is James Simon from CRL, uh, and I will be uh, serving as a uh, uh, coordinator of questions and answers and uh, of the, the speakers today. Uh, Bernie already suggested the uh, agenda, and we're going to turn this over to the first speaker, um, Lisa Brower, who's the president of the Linda Hall Library. Uh, Lisa has served as president of Linda Hall from 2008 to the present. Uh, prior to that, she served as university librarian at the New School uh, from 2002 to 2008. She's previously held positions at Yale's Beinecke Library, Vassar College, New York Public Library, and Indiana University. She's received her bachelor's as well as her, her master's in library science uh, from Indiana University, uh, in addition to an executive master in philanthropy. She has an additional master's in English and American literature from the University of Kansas and she'll be presenting about the Linda Hall Library collections. Lisa? Thank you, James, and welcome to the Linda Hall Library, everybody. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? The of Missouri, Kansas City, which surrounds us on all sides. We are good neighbors, and we work together whenever possible and whenever feasible, but uh, we have no formal affiliation with them whatsoever. We are completely independent. What you see on the slide, the center slide, is the library's main entrance. The building is actually much bigger than the screen capture shows, um, but it is our main entrance. We are very proud of it. To the left of that are some selections from our History of Science collection. And to the right of that is a picture of Siva Vaidyanathan speaking on the Googleization of everything. He was here about a year and a half ago speaking about his book. Uh, next slide, please. This is our mission statement. Um, I won't read it to you because you can read it very well yourself, but astute librarians will see embedded within it the um, instruction to acquire, preserve, and make available. It is there. That is the, um, those are the activities that pretty much make every library's mission statement turn, and this is our expression of that. Next slide, please. A little bit of history about the Linda Hall Library, since our history is not very well known. Uh, we are named for Linda Hall, who was the wife of a man named Herbert Hall, who made his fortune as a grain broker. We are no relation to the other Halls of Kansas City, who founded the greeting card company. Herbert made his fortune as a grain broker, and Linda was active in local philanthropies. Um, Linda died in 1938, Herbert died in 1941. They were a childless couple, but they were very civic-minded and left a portion of their estate and trust to establish a library for Kansas City. But by 1941, Kansas City, Missouri already had a public library, so the library's first board of trustees decided that a library devoted to science and technology would attract research and business to Kansas City, and to a large extent that happened. And that's how the Linda Hall Library came into being, and that's how it came to be a science and technology library. Next slide, please. Uh, the library opened in 1946, and it was originally housed in the Hall's mansion, which was built in 1912 on 20 acres of prime real estate. By the early 1950s, the library outgrew the mansion, and a new library building was built on the property, opening in 1956. And over time, some acreage was sold to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and through the years, the library added on several additions. Um, and at one point, the original mansion, unfortunately, was demolished. It had fallen into some disrepair. And it really was in the way of adding on to the library. But it was, we have photographs of the, the mansion. It was quite beautiful in its time. Next slide, please. Today, the library consists of 220,000 square feet of space. It houses over 1 million volumes in its general collection and over 10,000 volumes in its history of science collection. And the grounds, um, we, we now have 14 acres. Six acres were sold off, as I mentioned before. And the 14 acres are curated as an urban arboretum. And I should say that the 450 trees, representing 58 genera and 165 species, are curated with the same degree of care that our collections are. Um, 
we really do regard that as a responsibility of ours to preserve these uh, plantings and trees on the ground. Uh, new additions came along in 1964, in the 70s, two more additions, and in 2006, the last addition was built. Um, next slide, please. So our core collections were established with three principal collections, um, or three principal acquisitions. The first occurring in the late 40s, um, the Library of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which provided a foundation for our history of science collection and a core reference collection. The Franklin Institute Library was acquired in 1985, um, which also provided additional strength for the history of science. And then in 1995, the Library of the Engineering Societies um, and those materials came to us in, in 1995. The materials in that collection primarily came from the American Society of Chemical Engineers, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the IEEE, uh, the M American Institute of Mechanical Engineers. There's quite a lot of alphabet soup. I still have trouble wrapping my tongue around it. Um, but these were our core collections. Um, and we continue to build on the strengths that they brought to the library. Next slide, please. Uh, the materials of note are listed on this slide. Um, many of these materials are not part of our document delivery agreement with CRL due to certain royalty uh, arrangements we have with their publishers. We can, however, scan government documents. Um, we were originally going to restrict these because government documents were widely available in the Hadi Trust. But since Hadi has restricted access to public domain items to members of the Hadi Trust only, we have now decided to scan them as part of our uh, agreement with CRL. Next slide, please. This slide lists our collecting strengths, and it, I think it should be regarded as a generalization, but if we had to broadly characterize what we currently emphasize in the way of collection building, it would be these areas. Um, perhaps to physics and astrophysics, I should have added mathematics, which is an, an historical strength of ours. Uh, we also collect extensively in geology, biology, microbiology, and genetics, as well as soil science biochemistry and physiology. Uh, we, we continually reassess our collecting priorities uh, with respect to our budget imperatives. And we also try to be in a position to respond to new areas of scholarly inquiry as they develop. Um, historically, the languages in which we collect, in addition to English, are the ones listed. And they have the next slide, please. So um, if we were to break down our broad collecting areas, they would break down, as listed on this slide and the next slide, with respect to engineering and technology. Give me a second to look at that. And the next slide, please. And chemistry broadly organizes itself into these subcategories. Next slide, please. So among our 220,000 square feet of floor space, we maintain approximately 30 miles of shelving, which are divided as indicated on this slide. We do maintain an open stack collection of monographs that are, lim that are available for limited circulation. Um, however, most of our material, the, the vast majority of our material, does not circulate and it is stored in a closed stack arrangement and brought to people in the reading room upon request. Um, at this present time, I, I believe someone has asked at least one time for a serials title list. We, we can't produce one at this particular time. But we will be able to export a list from the paper database once our records are loaded into the paper database. So next slide, please. So among our serials holdings, we currently hold more than 45,000 print serials titles. And we currently 
received 3,700, more than 3,700 Prince Cereals titles. And I gave you a fun fact that we stumbled over a, a year or so ago, that the Linda Hall Library holds one of the most complete collections of 19th century railroad technology journals and periodicals available. Uh, we created a website on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, and it contains a goodly portion of the full text of these railroad technology journals digitized. So it's a great research resource for anybody who's interested in 19th century railroad technology. Next slide, please. We maintain uh, over 200 active exchange partners um, throughout the world. We have legacy collections from a one-time high of 450 exchange partners worldwide. Um, currently, we're maintaining the historic exchanges that were originated by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and we inherited when we acquired that collection. Um, many of the titles that we obtain via these exchange relationships have under 10 OCLC listings, holdings listings, and none of the titles we hold as a virtue of these exchange partnerships are widely held anywhere. So that makes these relationships that we maintain exceptionally valuable uh, for researchers. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide or two lists some of these longstanding uh, exchange relationships that, broadly speaking, are British, French, Italian, German, and Slavic in nature. Next slide, please. And the last slide, the next slide. So those three slides just give you a, an idea of our longstanding exchange relationships. We also maintain relationships with the major professional engineering societies. May I have the next, the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the ASME, the ASCE, the AICHE, the American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical and Petroleum Engineers, and the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. We receive their publications. Next slide, please. Patent and Trademark Collection. Um, this is a collection that I think is a, a frequently overlooked resource. And the Linda Hall Library is one of approximately 80 US libraries participating in the Patent and Trademark um, Depository Program. And uh, this program provides access to information and resources for the public to conduct self-directed patent searches. Our librarians can provide instruction and use instruction in the use of the search tool provided by the Patent and Trademark Office, they cannot actually do patent or trademark searches on behalf of the public, nor can they provide legal advice. But for scholars and researchers wanting to study the history of an invention or an innovation or a process, this collection is a wonderful resource <laughs> that is frequently overlooked. And it is available. Um, for document delivery, if people find information that is. So, next slide, please. Our history of science collection really is one of our crown jewels. And as I mentioned earlier, the collection did originate in 1947 with the purchase of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Library. Uh, a few smaller collections have also contributed to the strength of our history of science collection, and they include. The Herbert Hoover collection of rare books uh, having to do with mining and metallurgy, the Honeyman collection of science books, and the George White collection in early geology, which both of which were acquired in the 1980s, and the 1995 acquisition of the Engineering Society's library brought with it the Ball Gemology collection, um, which is a terrific resource and has enhanced this collection substantially. Um, the volumes in the History of Science collection date from the um, early, early century of printing, the 15th century, to the mid-20th century. Um, 
we can boast a complete set of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society of London, which began in 1665 and goes forward, as well as the other notable items that I list, which um, really are, are, I would say, emblematic of the strength of our collection. But I think my own personal feeling is that as wonderful as these, these items are, they're very iconic. Some of the most interesting items in the collection are ephemera and um, items that are not very well known, but they are just little gems of uh, information and a wonderful research resource for people who are studying various aspects. So, next slide, please. Uh, the Linda Hall Library's holdings are reflected in the ILL and the Linda Hall Library catalog. These uh, comprise the most up-to-date serials and issue-level holdings available. Uh, holdings are also um, reflected in the OCLC. Those are accurate. Our serials, holdings, records in OCLC need to be replaced. We know that, and it is a project that is scheduled to happen in 2013. So stay tuned for that. That will happen before the end of the year. Next slide, please. Um, I would say, in general, thanks to our wonderful relationship with CRL, our document delivery requests have increased 25% the first quarter of 2013 over the first quarter of 2012. And I think you can read the statistics on the slide um, very well for yourself, but we have seen in the final two quarters of 2012, and that's to say our relationship began July 1 of 2012, so the final two quarters we saw an uptick by 19% and a 12.5% um, increase in our fill rate. So this has been very gratifying to us. Um, it has kept our document delivery staff very happy. They are thrilled to be as busy as they are, and they keep telling me they could be a lot busier, so they welcome your request. Um, and we hope we are providing service that is pleasing to all of our clients. Um, next slide, please. So you can see the requests that we have received just through the first nine months of our relationship. Uh, nearly 10,000 requests. Of those requests, 7,900 have been filled or an 83% fill rate. So we regard this as excellent, and part of that success is due to the accuracy of the information that comes to us through the rapid request. Um, if the CRO member library is also a rapid member, its requests will be sent out to the rapid community, and there is no cost to them for receiving articles from other rapid members. But if an item has less than 25 libraries, an item that's requested uh, is held by less than 25 libraries, the request will come to Linda Hall Library first. I hope that makes sense to you. But I'm sure someone will ask a question if it doesn't. Um, next slide, please. OK, I think you can see for yourself. Uh, you can read for yourself how successful this has been, our requests coming through non-rapid member libraries. I would say an 84% fill rate is a really good statistic. Next slide, please. And let me just talk a little bit about uh, the services in addition to document delivery that the Linda Hall Library offers. Um, with respect to document delivery, those orders are filled through OCLC, uh, Rapid ILL, and On Demand. We currently deliver materials to institutions on every continent except Antarctica. Um, in addition to academic institutions, we also deliver to corporations, government agencies, law firms, and engineering firms. And with respect to interlibrary loan, we do not lend out our bound periodicals but we will circulate monographs for interlibrary loan. Um, our research assistance is delivered by our reference librarians who will look up definitions, facts, formulas, and other scientific and te technological information. 
They will help with the use of catalogs, databases, indices, and also confirm library holdings. Uh, with respect to digitization, um, at the present time, the digital content that is available um, on our website consists of some of our rare book holdings, some uh, materials that are more modern, like the 19th century railroad journals I mentioned a few minutes ago, and some of our digital holdings are based upon our exhibitions, which is to say that they are digitized versions of our exhibitions. And we expect the volume of our digital content to continue to grow, not only through demand uh, from our CRL clients, but just out of a sense that the way to broaden our constituency is to provide more and more of our content available electronically. So that will be growing in the years to come. We also facilitate image rights and reproductions when the use of a digital object uh, requires some assistance with image rights and reproductions. Next slide, please. I'd like to take a minute or two to mention our newly launched fellowship program. Um, we relaunched our resident fellowship program in 2012 after a three-year hiatus. And we now offer resident fellowships on a competitive basis. We solicit applications once a year, and anyone who has a master's degree or a more advanced degree than that, or is a doctoral student, um, uh, a professional scholar with or without an institutional affiliation, um, anybody who falls into one of those categories is welcome to apply. We solicit applications in the fall with a deadline for submission in early January. Uh, fellowships are available for a minimum of one month and a maximum of nine months. And the research projects that are proposed must require a substantial use of the Linda Hall Library's collections. Uh, additionally, we ask every resident fellow to present a, a public lecture or a public presentation of their project that usually occurs towards the end of their residency. Um, and those presentations have been videotaped and are available on our website for anybody who wants to see them. And more than one of our fellows has confided in me that they really appreciate the fact that they have been required to do this public presentation because not only does it give them practice in presenting their research findings before a reasonably friendly audience, but also because we videotape them, they now have a, a hot link that they can embed into their resumes or any other information they may want to send out for an application for other fellowships or for job applications. They actually have something that they can put forward. So it's a win-win for everybody all the way around. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and I thought I would give you just a list of the first five projects that were done by our first cohort of fellows. Um, they're all very different. They all cover various uh, areas of science and the history of science. Our first fellow who came last summer compared Protestant and Catholic perspectives on 17th and 18th century theories of the earth. We currently have a fellow examining engineering as a profession in Germany and the U.S. from the 1870s to 1930. Another fellow who's currently wrapping up his work is doing research on colonizing Amazonia from the air. Another one who is also wrapping up his time here is uh, performing an analysis of regulatory engineers in the Environmental Protection Agency and Engineering Societies. And a fellow who has, next slide please. A fellow who has just recently left us uh, is working on a doctorate uh, studying European attempts to classify plants that were native to the New World, the uses of those plants, and the effect that the classification of those plants had on that should read colonial hierarchies. Apologize for my typo. And we are looking forward to welcoming our next cohort of fellows, which actually one of them just arrived this week but our fellows for 2013-2014 um, have equally diverse projects, and we're looking forward to knowing more about them. So just before I wrap up, I want to say, may I have the next slide, please? 
Thank you. A little bit about our public programming. One of the ways we reach out to our public and um, broaden the public interest in science and the history of science is to have a very vibrant public education program. And to that end, we maintain a fall and spring lecture series. Again, most of our lectures are videotaped and become available permanently on the library's website. And like our document delivery, our videos have been viewed in countries on every continent except Antarctica, um, which I think is a little unfair because I sat through March of the Penguins. I think it's only fair that a penguin or two sat through some of our videos, but there you go. <laughs> uh, and I've given you a link to the page on our website where you can access these videos. If you get there, you will find presentations by people such as uh, one of the last two Mercury 7 astronauts who are still living, Scott Carpenter, Harrison Schmidt, who was the last astronaut to walk on the moon, astronaut Steve Hawley, who launched the Hubble Space Telescope into space, um, anthropologist Richard Rangham and Bill Saturno, physicist Sean Carroll, Sarah Seeger, and Seth Shostak, and many other prominent scientists and historians of scientists. Uh, excuse me, historians of science. Um, next slide, please. And if you would like further information about the library's online catalog or the digital collections, you can go to those links. If you would like more information about any technical aspect of my presentation today, you can contact Carrie Cassio. Document delivery questions, you can go to Ben Gibson. I'd just like to point out that the the top photograph on this slide is a photograph of two of our fellows, Jerusha Westbury, who did the study of, of uh, colonial native plants, and John Min Lee, who was studying the EPA. Next slide, please. And if you have questions about collections and services in general, you can contact Mary Moeller. And I apologize, I should have listed uh, our history of science librarian, Bruce Bradley. Oops, email is bradleyb at lindahall.org. Um, if you have questions about our History of Science collection, you can direct them directly to Bruce Bradley. And that concludes my presentation. It's been a real pleasure and an honor speaking with all of you today and offering this virtual tour of the library. And I hope many of you will have an opportunity to visit us in person. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, really appreciate the, the thorough overview that you were able to give here today uh, and to give a sense of the physical space as well. Uh, I wanted to give uh, just a few minutes uh, of an opportunity for uh, members and participants on the, the discussion here uh, to ask any questions or to make any comments. Um, you, you can do that through the chat or on the phone as Lori will explain. And thank you. To ask a question or if you have a comment at this time, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Just a reminder, if you are joining us via speakerphone today, make sure your mute function is turned off to allow that signal to reach our equipment. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, star 1, and we will pause for just a moment. And we will go first to Susan Zappin. Hi, uh, this is Susan Zappin. I may have missed it. You may have said this already, but are your slides from today available to us? I would certainly love to share all of this information with my colleagues. Uh, Susan, as far as I'm concerned, they can be available to you. James, um, my slides are being held captive by James at CRL. <laughs> That's right. We'll, we'll sell them for a price. Uh, no, <laughs> these these uh, these will absolutely be made available. Um, uh, we are recording the session, uh, so you'll be able to view both the slides and to direct uh, other people at your library to uh, watch the presentations themselves. We'll send some connecting information to that uh, out to all of the participants after the meeting. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. And we have no further further audio questions at this time. But was there anything via the chat feature at this time? Nope, not at this time. Anyone else? Sounds like Lisa did a good job of covering the territory. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Bernie. It was a real pleasure. Likewise. Uh, just to mention that Lisa will be with us throughout the remainder of the presentation, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, have the opportunity to respond to questions or comments 
um, that you may have at a later time. So if anything comes up along the way, uh, we welcome those uh, at any time. Uh, however, at this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Stephen Weldon, uh, who, is, uh, who is joining us um, today from uh, the University of Oklahoma. Stephen Weldon is the editor of the ISIS, Current Bibliography of the History of Science, a position that he's held since 2002. He's a faculty member in the History of Science Department at the University of Oklahoma, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate classes on the history of science. His specialization is the history of the relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, is the history of the relationship between science and religion. And he's finishing a book on this topic entitled The Scientific Spirit of American Humanism. So look for that. In his capacity as the bibliography for the History of Science Society, he surveys thousands of recent scholarly books and articles in the discipline yearly. His most recent project involves working closely with librarians and scholars in the development of a new bibliographical tool that will deploy the bibliography database in new ways, utilizing new tools and concepts being developed in the digital humanities. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to explain that uh, in more detail because it sounds fascinating. Uh, Stephen, are you on the phone? I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Well, uh, th th thank you very much. I, I want to uh, uh, th thank uh, both Bernard Riley and Jane Simon for uh, making this possible. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to, to speak with all of you today. Uh, this is a completely new forum for me, uh, and it's a little awkward because normally I speak to people that I'm seeing in front of me. So um, it's going to be, uh, uh, if I pause a few minutes, uh, you'll perhaps understand why. Um, I, I really am honored to be uh, on a panel with uh, Lisa Brower and uh, Stephen Bosch. Uh, the Linda Hall Library that we just heard described is an extraordinarily important resource. Um, everyone uh, at my institution uh, knows of it and, and is, is very, um, very pleased about uh, the kinds of services that they've, author off that they've offered, and uh, we oftentimes uh, travel over there. Um, I am, uh, as, as you heard, working at the History of Science Department at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we have ourselves a very strong special collection at the library here, and uh, that, uh, in fact, that special collection is uh, really the reason for the presence of the department as well. Um, and um, I can explain a little bit more about the history of that institution if you like, but I want to, to move on. I did want to make one comment. The slide uh, that you see in the background, uh, there is a, pic a picture of the moon that comes from Galileo's Starry Messenger, which is one of the prizes of the History of Science collection at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, this particular version uh, was one that Galileo himself owned and, uh, and has some of his writing in it. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting document itself, as is the, the rest of the collection. But um, let, me, uh, let me go on. So could I have the next slide? Right, the, the thing that I, I want to emphasize about um, the... Uh, the history of science is that it is a very eclectic discipline. And uh, we really do have uh, a, a lot of different methods that we, we work with and a lot of different materials that we work on. When I first started uh, as a graduate student in history of science, one of the most um, revealing moments uh, in, in one of those first few seminars that I had was when, when the professor of the class said, you know, historians of science are unique we can be found in almost every library on campus. Uh, and that, that comment really stuck with me a long time. And I understand it very well because, in fact, uh, if I didn't end up in every library, I know among, uh, among my cohort, we all ended up in every single library on campus at one point or another in our career. Um, and that, in a sense, is the theme of my, my entire lecture today, that um, if we're thinking about trying to understand the history of science, we really need to think broadly and try to understand uh, the, materials that, that the materials that we use uh, 
really reach reach quite far. Okay, um, could I have the next slide, please? I want to give you a very brief uh, background in the, to the history of science for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, our, uh, our founder in the United States was the expatriate Belgian by the name of George Sarton. Uh, he came of age uh, as a scholar in the heady years of the Belle Epoch era, the late 19th and early 20th century, and he imbibed the progressive ideals of his generation. Uh, he was highly cosmopolitan in the way that he thought about the world, and that comes through in the way that, that he designed the history of science, and in fact, in the way that the history of science is, uh, is, uh, continues to be practiced today. Could I have the next slide? So one of the uh, important, uh, most important friends of George Sarton in terms of the topic for today it was uh, Paul Otley, uh, also a Belgian and very interested in uh, understanding uh, information. Um, and he himself also embodied really important ideals that uh, were uh, in, in many ways revealing uh, and that Sarton himself uh, embraced. Uh, those of you uh, in, uh, who have uh, spent time uh, in, in library studies will know Paul Otley as the founder of the Universal Decimal Classification System. And the distinctive thing about his thinking was that he envisioned a world um, connected, interconnected by information. He, he was one of the first visionaries of something very much like today's Internet. And, um, and beyond that, he thought that that kind of information would be a key to developing a peaceful uh, cosmopolitan uh, world. And uh, so this, this notion of, of cosmopolitanism uh, sort of sits down at the, very, at the very bitter of his thinking. And that was true for Sarton as well. And so the points that I wanted to make about Sarton and his friendship with Otley uh, are that um, First of all, both of these men were very closely connected with bibliography and information management. Sarton was the founder not only of our discipline, but also of the journal ISIS, as well, and, and with it, and in the very first issue of that, he, he uh, published his bibliography of the history of science, the, uh, the, the project that I am currently uh, working uh, on, working to continue. Second, uh, I, I want to say that the bibliography the, the, the vision of history of science was, was really uh, a, a, an extraordinarily broad vision. Uh, history and civilization uh, were, were to be explained in large part by the history of science itself. So could I have the next slide? The ISIS current bibliography uh, currently has uh, about 4,000 entries annually. Uh, I work with a couple uh, graduate students at my institution to classify um, all of these, these entries, and we cover a uh, time period that ranges from the prehistory to the 21st century. We cover, uh, our geographical coverage is worldwide. We, we take things in all languages, uh, and uh, the disciplines that we cover range from, uh, from the natural sciences to the social sciences, as well as engineering, technology, medicine, even agriculture, and the veterinary sciences. So uh, we, we really do cover things quite broadly. And um, uh, so the first, the, the first two points I want to make uh, following this really are, um, really have to do with the way that, uh, with the things that we can understand from the bibliography itself. So could I have the next slide? The, um, the, the, these, the two pie charts that follow, this one and the one on the next slide, are, uh, are they, they tell us how currently uh, the historians ha have uh, focused on different topics. So all the, the, the material here comes directly from the bibliography. The numbers aren't precise, uh, but they give us a pretty good in, indication. I haven't gone back to really clean up the data, but this is, this is pretty close. And, and so um, the first slide here deals with uh, chronological period. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, 
the um, there's a, a small blue section of, uh, noted uh, there, non-Western and colonial uh, histories of science, about 8%. The rest of that tends to be mostly European or, or, or uh, science that has been uh, sort of deeply influenced by European uh, uh, historical uh, culture. Uh, and so within that, you can see that there are about 9% of the scholars doing prehistory to medieval studies. Early modern to 18th century consists of about 23%. 19th century, 23%. 20th century, 25%. And the late 20th century, really post-1950 to the present, is 12%. There's one other thing that I wanted to uh, point out. This gives us a, uh, a sort of a picture of the history of science uh, as it stands right now. Uh, this past winter, I was contacted by a scholar, an undergraduate at King's College in Halifax named Bob Olson, and he uh, said he had done a pretty extensive uh, analysis of the bibliographies of the past, and he had been interested in the chronological focus over the years. And he came to the conclusion that the history of science has really developed quite a bit over the years. When it started, the focus, the the, the largest percentage of articles um, was in the pre-modern period. So around 1920, this, this pie chart would have looked vastly different. Uh, by the 1940s, the focus had shifted to the early modern. By the 1980s, it had shifted again to the 19th and 20th centuries. And now, as you see, our main focus uh, in terms of just the, the, the sheer bulk of uh, publications is uh, uh, 20th and, 20, and, and late 20th and 21st centuries. So there has been an evolution over, over time in the way that, that historians have looked at things. But at the next slide. The, uh, this slide um, has, uh, it, it shows how we tend to divide things up in terms of discipline. And, and if you look here, you see that uh, to, to a large extent, we're pretty evenly divided uh, in the way that we look at things. Philosophy and math, about 15%. The physical sciences, 19%. Earth and environmental sciences, 13%. Uh, biological sciences, 16%. Uh, social sciences tends to be the smallest portion of that, about 4%. Uh, I think it's probably larger, but um, and, and getting larger but I don't have any sp uh, special uh, uh, statistics to demonstrate that at this point. Uh, medicine is uh, the largest piece of the pie, but a lot of that medicine uh, should probably be uh, included in the biological sciences as well. So um, when you now have kind of a, a broad picture of what the, what the discipline is like, uh, now I'd like to take you to the next slide and really begin to think about what uh, what this means in terms of the, the nitty-gritty of research. I'm going to introduce two terms here, uh, internalism and externalism. These, are, these, these two terms uh, really uh, were, were major classifying terms of where, what sorts of history historians did back uh, a couple decades ago, and, and from the 1940s to the to about the 1980s, people talked a lot about internalism and externalism, and there was a debate between between historians about about which one uh, really constituted the best kind of history of science and so forth. So we argued a lot about it. We don't so much anymore, and I, I hope you'll see why in a few minutes. Let me let me explain what I mean. Internalism, uh, I think, is sort of the knee-jerk reaction, the knee-jerk understanding of what history of science is. You, you want to know what science was like? Well, you study the theories uh, of, the, of the scientists themselves. And so we, we have um, a really a close analysis of the logic of, of discovery and the logic of invention as, as we try to understand what, what happened in the way that science developed. Externalism, by contrast, would be how science is connected to the rest of the world. Um, we're not looking just at the logical development of ideas. We're looking at um, how scientists uh, were connected to the world psychologically, socially, intellectually, 
Uh, what other forces impinged upon scientists to make them think the things that they thought, to allow them to make it possible for them to go to the places they went to do their work? Uh, and, and conversely, how did the scientific ideas translate into the rest of the world? So, that, so somehow we're in this division of between internal and external, we've got a wall separating that which is science and that which is not science, and the externalists are pushing and pushing to break that wall away. And, and that ultimately, I think, is what's happened, um, that we are now living in, in a world in which the discipline of history of science really doesn't see uh, the, the precise boundary as it did uh, perhaps uh, 20, 30 years ago. The slide here, the picture that I have uh, uh, showing, is uh, uh, the uh, Bethlehem Hospital, known, also known as the Bedlam Lunatic Asylum. And, and it was, um, uh, I, I put it up there because it, it gives you a kind of an interesting picture. You look at that, you see this, this beautiful ornate building, uh, and that's a place where inside uh, scientific ideas are being applied in, in very uh, strict ways. We have the interior spaces of that building are, are uh, places in which scientific uh, ideas about how to supervise, how to control, how to understand mental illness are being uh, dealt with. And so um, one of the questions that, uh, that the author of the book that this was taken from uh, is thinking about is what is the relationship between this external presentation of science to the public and the internal uh, development of, of the scientific ideas inside the asylum. So could I have the next slide? We can continue this analysis even further. There's a lot, there are a lot of studies about the, um, uh, the laboratory. And here is an illustration that, it, that uh, have, that also that comes from a different book. Uh, this particular uh, image is uh, of the architectural plans for Liverpool University College. Uh, the, the laboratory, the one level of the laboratory or of the college has, uh, has seating, uh, the top one, we're looking at seats in a lecture theater, and the bottom one is, uh, is uh, this is a laboratory it's where, student, where students do lab work. They're set up more or less the same way with the same idea, once again, dealing with, with ideas like control and supervision, how the professor or the, the lab leader is going to be relating directly to either the students uh, listening to him or her, him at that time, uh, or, uh, what, or how, they, how he is going to be directing the students in, in the, uh, the laboratory work. So the question about how science is being done in the lab actually can be answered in part by looking at the architectural plans of this building. Well, that right there begins to, I think, illustrate uh, as clearly as I can uh, some of what I mean by the breakdown of internal and external. Scientists, historians of science, are really interested in, in uh, how science gets made, but we're not just looking at the theories themselves. So if you're a librarian, and you, have, and you have architectural plans in your library, those may be very interesting to historians of science uh, and in ways that you might not initially consider. Could I have the next slide? Okay, here we'll, we'll continue this notion, of, uh, this uh, study of the laboratory. Um, here we see a photograph of, of a scientist in his lab. It turns out that this laboratory is in a home, and we can tell that because there's wallpaper on the wall that's not obscured by the, the cabinet there. But everything else looks more, like, more or less like a laboratory that you might find, or a lab bench that you might find inside of a, uh, of a laboratory um, in an institution. What this photograph and this analysis was uh, trying to do was to demonstrate that there is this, this permeable uh, membrane 
uh, that that um, sort of separates professional and domestic areas. So here, here we have uh, historians trying to understand more about what's going on in the lab and in the nature of discovery by trying to understand where those labs are located. Are they in homes? Are they in institutions? And what does it mean when you get scientists working in these places? What does it mean uh, to the scientists? What does it mean to the technicians who may be employed by the scientists? What does it mean to the information that is being um, discovered in these laboratories? So um, these are some of the big questions that come out of uh, investigations. And um, here we are looking at something as simple as what's going on in the laboratory. I think a really different picture of, of what science is begins to emerge when you start thinking about these things. OK, could I have the next slide? So the, um, th there are a number of um, studies now of popular science. In fact, um, People, a, a number of historians have, have turned to, to the study of popular science to, to give us a really a, a better understanding of, of what, what this boundary is between science and, and the public. And it becomes harder and harder to understand even where elite science and popular science um, uh, falls. This image is a, is a schematic drawn by one historian suggesting that uh, there is an enormous amount of overlap between, on the one side, science designed for people outside of a, a, of a scientific elite, the popularization here, and number two, what those people do with it, the reception and transformation of it, and three, non-elite scientific practices, uh, ethnoscience. So all of this stuff uh, kind of is these are different ways of, of understanding what popular science is. Um, there was another image in the same, in the same uh, uh, text that, that tra also blurs the image between, between the elite science itself and the popularization. And so th there is a great deal of, of uh, overlap there. I, I wanna, while we're looking at this, I want you to, um, I wanna talk to you about a, a very important uh, historical book that came out um, uh, several years ago called Victorian Sensation. Many of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily important for our discipline. The author, James Secord, looks at, pre, at, at uh, a pre-Darwinian account of evolution that was popular in the early 19th century, just before Darwin uh, began writing. Uh, the, the book uh, itself um, was written for a popular audience by a non-scientist. So it was popular in, in two senses of the word. Yet its importance to the way that science developed was extraordinary. It was an ex extremely important work. And Darwin read it, knew of it, and uh, changed, clearly changed the way that he thought about presenting his own work in response to the reception of this particular work. And so here we have a popular work very much influencing the, uh, the science itself and the way that the science gets presented. So The Origin of Species might have been a very different book had this book not come out. Um, the other interesting part of this, this, uh, this uh, 19th century book and about this, and the other interesting part of the analysis of this book uh, that James Secord does is that he looks at publishing technologies and comes to uh, uh, comes to the conclusion that the very technology of publication, in press in this case, was very important uh, to the way that the um, that this text was received, and the different editions of this particular text, some meant for the lay public and some meant for the elite, were read in very different ways. And he, he analyzes diaries, he analyzes uh, letters back and forth to people, 
uh, and it counts as a book and reviews. So a huge number of different kinds of sources go into understanding how this popular book was received and transferred uh, from one place to the next. So we, we're, we're beginning to look at, I'm, I'm, I, hope to, I hope you're getting a sense that, that there are some really, really interesting um, stories uh, that come out of these, this kind of analysis that tell us a lot about what science is and how it, how it works. Um, so I'll take, we'll take this a, a step further. Let's go to the next slide. Another very interesting uh, type of analysis these days is textbook analysis. Turns out that what, uh, what is written in the textbook is extremely important to understand. There's textbook analysis of both high school, uh, of both grade and high school texts as well as university texts. And these, uh, because they're for different audiences, have, different, have, have importance in different ways. But uh, I think you'll find that the, um, the studies of textbooks are extremely, um, extremely important. Uh, let me try to explain why. Um, the, the image that you see here um, is a sticker from Hunter's New Civic Biology. This text was the text at the center of the, of the Scopes trial, the infamous uh, monkey trial of the 1920s, uh, which was uh, forbidden to be taught uh, because of its inclusion of evolution uh, by the Tennessee, uh, it, was, it was forbidden by a Tennessee law uh, that had just been enacted. And of course, it was, it was this, this, uh, that, this trial that inspired uh, the, movie in, the movie and play Inherit the Wind. Um, but looking at the text, you find that uh, really very interesting uh, sorts of things are going on. It turns out that the, uh, the, the state was frequently much more interested in the price of books than the content of them. And by putting this controversy, uh, this intellectual controversy, in the context of the, the interaction among the, the legal and, um, uh, and the, the, the legal and political ideas uh, that uh, it was in, that really transforms the way that you understand uh, how all of this is going, going on. So I guess the message for librarians at this point is we really need to take, uh, uh, we need to preserve and document the, uh, the various kinds of textbooks. These are not things that need to be just discarded when the next one comes out. The way that these textbooks change over time is really important. Um, so go back to the next slide. I'm going to, uh, uh, to move fairly quickly uh, through these next two slides, just ma making a couple observations. Um, this, this slide and the next both come from, um, well, this slide comes from a, a book that uh, Darwin published after The Origin of Species, dealing with the emotion uh, of animals. And psychology turns out, of course, to be really important as a study of science. And that's what we have here. Uh, an early attempt to understand uh, people's psychological, emotional responses um, through biology. But I have the next slide. But perhaps it's important to understand the psychology of the scientist himself or herself. And here we have a picture of Darwin uh, with his young son. And uh, so the kinds of questions that we might ask are, to what extent does uh, objectivity um, does objectivity come come out uh, of uh, a historical analysis? So um, here we have, uh, and, and I guess let me sort of quickly uh, mention the um, the point, the, sort of the takeaway message that I want to have. Uh, want to give to librarians, which is the kind of study of these emotions uh, is uh, something that you would, in order to do it, you need access both to the printed publication source, but also to the notebooks and letters and other sorts of things of Charles Darwin. Okay, let me have the next slide, if I may. 
Uh, there's a lot of work now on global colonial and post-colonial history of science. And I will uh, say only a couple points uh, about this, because I understand my, my uh, time is running short. So I will uh, just, uh, just say that in this area, probably the most important thing to try to get access to are uh, are materials, are native materials that come from places outside of Europe. What, one of the really big questions that the historians are posing now are how did non-Europeans understand this encounter with Western science? And these things are extraordinarily difficult to, to get a handle on. I, we have a graduate student in our program now who's working on slave technology in the Caribbean, and, and she tells me it is extremely difficult to find the proper documents that will be able to tell her what the, perspective, the slave perspective is. Much of that was either not recorded or has been wiped out. Well, next slide, please. Um, uh, this I will also just mention in passing, another really important area um, uh, of study has to do with the Cold War science and the military. Once again, the, uh, the economic, political, social, and cultural are incredibly intertwined in this period. Um, and a book that I often use in my class to, to uh, sort of highlight the complexity of this is one that doesn't deal directly with the military at all, but deals very much with the biological sciences, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It was a New York Times bestseller, and it's extraordinarily interesting from this point of view, even though it's uh, written by a, a journalist and not a historian. So we get a lot of really interesting material from all different, um, uh, all different areas. One more slide, please. Okay, finally I want to conclu conclude about big data and computational history of science. Um, this the, as we move into the 21st century, data becomes a central player, not only in the sciences, where you can imagine the difficulty of the historians as they try to dig deeply into uh, what science, uh, in, into what was going on, say, in the discovery of the Higgs boson, where you have thousands of individuals and enormous amounts of data and computational tools um, how do you deal with all of that? These are questions that historians are currently uh, grappling with. Not only that, but how do you? Uh, are, but can we employ these the data and these computational tools to to change the way that we think about how history can be done? In other words, perhaps we can begin to employ big data on historical topics to try to understand better how, in, as in this case, the image that you're looking at, how Kant uh, and, and Hume are related in two different encyclopedias. In this case, it's the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And um, so trying to understand how these things work using new tools also is extremely uh, complicated and very, uh, and very interesting. This is the cutting edge of, of uh, the history of science. It's largely this kind of work that uh, I'm thinking about as I move into the 21st century with the, with the ISIS bibliography, trying to understand how that might be able to, um, to help us understand uh, science in new ways and help historians um, on new projects. So I'm going to stop there because I know my time is probably almost up, uh, and I do want to give uh, a couple minutes at least for questions if there are some. And once again, to the audience at this time, if you have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Please remember to release your mute function before pressing the corresponding digit so the signal does reach our equipment. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, star 1. This is James. I'm going to perhaps declare executive privilege. And, and Stephen, thank you for that. That was uh, uh, tremendously uh, broad-spanning and thought-provoking. Um, one of the things you suggested, of course, uh, piqued my interest where you, you say the history of science is in every library on campus. And 
Um, I was wondering if you, if you had a sense, um, broadly speaking, about the, the types of sources people are delving into now. Where, where, is, where are people finding new uh, insights into science where, where one might not think um, outside of uh, you know, pure science uh, uh, journals and, and archival records and things like that? Give us an example or so. Sure. Um, well, I, I think uh, I think that uh, if we if we consider, say, uh, the notion of the architecture uh, and the la the laboratory, for example, as 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 one place. Well, I mean, it, it, it seems to me, in order to really understand uh, what it means when you build a laboratory, you've got to have first of all archival material about the way that the that a laboratory was built and any kind of information that you can have about how scientists were thinking about it. But you also have to know something about architectural, um, um, you know, the, the, the direction and the, the nature of architecture at the particular time. And what, what were architects thinking? So I think the, 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 what you, what you uh, ask really has, uh, you know, it sort of suggests that if you're interested in architecture, you, you might want to, you really need to know about what, what the conventions are at the time. The same is true, I think, for popularization. And, and, and I think one, one easy thing that, that um, I think librarians could do is to grab those journals and books that deal with popular science, even peripherally, and natural history, uh, things that have been written for the public, and, and uh, might seem so totally outdated that they're they're worthless. These are valuable items. Uh, textbooks, as I mentioned, those are really really valuable. We can learn a lot about science from those kinds of things. Um, so, um, I, I guess th those are those are uh, a couple areas in which I think we really ought to uh, pay it, pay close attention to. We need to preserve as much of the record. Uh, as possible. Thank you for that. Stephen, this is Bernie Riley at CRL. I echo James' uh, comment that it was a very good presentation, very interesting and, and thought-provoking. You mentioned at the end the, the big data and the computational history. Um, we've had a number of conversations here at CRL and uh, one webinar recently about text mining, about the mining of large bodies of text. Uh, a lot of the discussion was in the context of a lot of the large bodies of text being held within proprietary uh, journal um, platforms, and so not not easy to text mine. Can you just say a little bit about what you're seeing in the way of text mining of, of electronic sources, and maybe what some of those sources are? Well, it's. Uh, I think the first thing I have to say is that it's really new. Historians of science have not done much of it. The kind of work that uh, that I was talking about at the very end is is uh, is stuff that you're just just beginning to see, uh, and and it re does require a lot. It it does require access to well, often it does require access to full text sources. So uh, the one example that was a sort of a test example that I that one of our one of my colleagues uh, brought to the conference was uh, the idea of trying to understand how malaria um, treatment w w changed after, the, after uh, it was understood what the cause of malaria really was. And so the etiology of the disease arrived. Did that change the way that people thought about it? And so to understand that, they go back, this is from the 1860s to the 1910s, to try to I, I believe, if I understand the study correctly, do text mining um, on uh, all as many as many uh, reports of treatment as possible to try to get some sense both of the change as well as geographic distribution. That could be done because those are old enough that the that the materials are accessible. And when you get to contemporary stuff, if we're looking at Say things like the like the discovery of the Higgs boson, for example. Well, what what kind of material you need uh, might or might not be accessible. Um, 
I think um, th this is a really serious question, and it's not quite clear what what way we want to go. I, I mean, I think the, the consensus of the conference was we need to continue to talk about this and make sure that that we are firmly behind open access as much as conceivably possible, and 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 breaking down the the uh, the barriers at least in so far as as it's, as we can. So. Um, I don't know if that completely answers your question. But yeah, yeah. Actually, the, I wondered if about the malaria treatment um, study was that what body of material was that? Was that using the Google Books corpus? Was that using the engram? I know a lot of you know. I, I'm not. I, it was not using the engram. Uh, it was. Uh, it was done with uh, software that's being developed at the University of uh, at Arizona State um, with uh, uh, under the work of uh, people like Jane Mayenshine and, and Manfred Lobichler. Um, and I'll, I'd have to look back at that study to find out exactly where, what he's using, but I can, I can get, I can get some of that information and give you a better sense of that a little bit. That'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Okay. I had one other question, if I can, um, uh, push my luck here a little bit. You had <laughs> sure. you were talking about the, um, colonial period and the, uh, concerns of colonialism and globalism and the kind of scarcity of sources for understanding what some of the uh, populations under colonial rule thought about science and knew about science, that kind of thing. And I wonder if mission society records have been a useful source of that kind of thing. Yes. The answer is unequivoc unequivocally yes. The mission society records uh, are very helpful. But they still are only giving sort of the Western perspective, and so the the, the trick yeah. is now to go to find the other side. And, and some studies are being able, are going back. To, in, so I, I read about a study in um, uh, South Asia where uh, people are looking at uh, murals on Buddhist uh, temple walls that give some indication of. Uh, of the understanding of certain kinds of concepts that were that would have been relevant to the reception of scientific ideas from the West. I see. Uh, or uh, or items from uh, like palm uh, palm leaf uh, records that have been preserved in different libraries. So they're they're really unusual sources. I see. Thanks. We have about uh, uh, one or two more minutes. Are there any other questions from the audience? We have no questions from the telephone audience at this time, gentlemen. Well, good. This was uh, this was quite uh, quite a nice uh, rejoinder, I think, to the uh, connecting the the thoughts and the use of material to the the Lydna Hall collection. And I think to bring bring all of these pieces together, um, we've we've given the <laughs> difficult task to to Steve Bosch uh, uh, to kind of synthesize a little bit about. Uh, the strengths of the collections and, and collection building. Um, yeah, before we before we jump into that, though, I, there was there was a um, a question on the chat that I did want to um, just just bring bring forward. It wasn't for Stephen, so I, I was going to hold on to it. But uh, in the interest of, of making sure that we are being responsive to those who are asking, um, one of our participants asked, uh, "What specific privileges does CRL uh, member institutions have with the Linda Hall Library?" Uh, and that uh, I think that speaks a bit to the the core of the partnership itself. And um, I can I can give it in in some sweeping formats, but also mention that um, recently we conducted a, a webinar, March 2013 webinar, um, about the Linda Hall partnership. And you can find that um, event page uh, on our website as well as on our YouTube channel, um, which goes into some of the details, specific details of the partnership arrangements and processes for. Um, uh, both the the article delivery and monograph digitization uh, and some other things, but um, specifically those those privileges. Um, Amanda, your your question um, is that uh, all CRL members through through CRL uh, and the partnership with Linda Hall uh, have the ability to request article delivery from uh, both CRL and Linda Hall 
collections in science, technology, and engineering, a uh, combined total of about 50,000 journals. Um, and uh, Lisa talked a little bit about the process of that being through rapid ILL, which CRL has set up at all of its member institutions um, through the interlibrary loan offices where they can use that to request articles from Lin the Linda Hall partnership. Um, the, uh, this was the first phase of the partnership was article delivery. The second phase, which we've sort of moved into here and, and Steve will be talking about, um, is not just uh, targeted uh, um, collection digitization, but also building the collection that is sharing information about the strengths and the overlaps, uh, considering where, where our members are interested in the collections to be developed and how we can um, push forward in areas of, of greatest interest. Um, I can provide more details perhaps at the end if, if we have some additional time on that. Thank you.